Pavilion, uh, you're probably very familiar with the fact that a year from now, the UN will be convening the high-level meeting on UHC to revisit a commitment made in 2019. A lot has changed in three years. <laughs> That's an understatement. Um, and yet the fact remains that health equity is not a reality. So this session is all about how do we move from rhetoric, there's a lot of it around global health equity, to reality. What steps need to be taken? What challenges stand in the way? What more is needed? Hopefully we can even inspire some partnerships in the room. Uh, so we're joined by two great speakers to discuss this topic. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Vanita Gupta to the stage. Thank you. She's director of the Secretariat of the Action Global Health Advocacy Partnership, which we'll hear more about. I'd also love to welcome Temi Giwa Tubasun. She's the founder and CEO of LifeBank which helps hospitals to discover and deliver um, essential medical supplies in Nigeria and beyond. So we'll hear more about that as well. Thank you both so much for joining us and welcome. So let's start by uh, just acknowledging the challenge and then I wanna work toward discussing what does reality look like. Um, we discussed ahead of this conversation, I don't want the conclusion of this conversation to be we need to move from rhetoric to reality, <laughs> but to actually talk about what does that look like? And of course you both are doing important work right along these lines. So um, I'll start with you, if that's all right, Vanita. Um, I know that so often when we have these conversations, we talk about the importance of lived experience and certainly you have that. So while I know typically on panels, we don't focus on bios, in this conversation, we're actually gonna talk a lot about both of your paths to where you are today. We have an activist and we have an entrepreneur on stage. And I'd love to hear about your perspectives and then bring you in conversation with each other. So tell us more about the path to where you are today and why that lived experience shapes what you're able to do. So that's interesting, Catherine. Um, I grew up in India and I started my right to health advocacy and activism when I was the 18 year old medical student. But you know what? I had real feel and lesson when I started living here in the US 20 years ago. This October, it'll be 20 years ago. And it's in living in India as a, uh, from a family of physicians and politically influential fam family, I could not think that I would not have access to best healthcare. But when I started living in uh, US for a short period of time, I did not have healthcare. And I did not have dental care. And I made a choice to get my tooth extracted rather than save it. I had to call my batchmate from medical school who practices in California to say, hey, do you know anybody, dental doctor, I'm in a lot of pain, who can pull it and not take the money? So he called favors. And that's when I realized that it's one thing to work as an advocate and activist, but it's another thing when you get that lesson yourself. Mm -hmm. And also it reminds us that, and if we have learned anything from COVID, that's one thing. It's everybody's business. Mm -hmm. And in the US, unfortunately, we are one job loss and one medical calamity away mm -hmm. from being on the other side of health equity. Mm -hmm. So I feel like um, for many, many years, working as a physician, working on right to health, working at a very um, primary health care center, delivering babies uh, with nothing, almost nothing, to living here in the US and having the first hand experience of what it means to not have health care and to make choices that you know are not in favor of your health. So that really shaped up my thinking. And I think in US, we have this arrogance of we invest in other countries, we talk what solutions we propose, although we call it localization, right? But we want them, people from other countries to regurgitate what they presume to be our thinking, right? So I think it's time for us to learn. Mm -hmm. We have the most messed up primary healthcare system, if I can even say that we have it, <laughs> right? So it's time to learn where people have made some progress. Thank you so much. Temi, I wanna hear more from you. Uh, I'm very familiar with LifeBank. My, my focus at DevX is on tech and innovation. And I know LifeBank has been a rising star in the space of global health tech and innovation. But for those who are less familiar, can you talk about not only 
your path to founding LifeBank, but how it directly connects with this issue of global health equity and not just talking about it, but doing something about it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, for me, I have maybe a single passion. Uh, of course, the work we do at LifeBank is a, a lot larger than my personal passion. But for me, I have, even before I became a mother, I have been obsessed with maternal health uh, for as long as I can remember. Um, and when I became a mom about eight years ago, um, I had a very difficult birth. And I think I felt like the universe was moving me towards this direction. I already had an intellectual passion for it. And now I had a, a personal reason to uh, you know, do this work and make it my life's work. Um, one of the things that animated this passion was, you know, I found out a very innocuous, you know, fact that I think many people would have seen, but that just sort of like entered my head and would not leave. Uh, that four out of five women could survive childbirth if you simply moved blood into the facility where they were delivering. And I just thought like, I'm not a doctor. I can't really fix all the other cause of maternal mortality, but this one I could do. I could do something about like four out of five. Those are great odds. Uh, so what I did was moved back from the US to Nigeria uh, and started LifeBank, basically building that supply chain system, started with blood, during the pandemic, expanded to medical oxygen, medical consumables, and now even doing medical equipment and building that supply chain for all the supplies and all the equipment that hospitals need to deliver quality healthcare. So for me, I think that the plight of women, I think is something that the world has ignored for a very long time. We always speak around it, uh, but instead of also like doing that commitment, making that commitment and that will to really transform maternal health has been really missing. And for me, the, the journey to health equity for me is making childbirth safer, mm. making childbirth, honoring the people who bring life uh, into the world and sustain the human race. Uh, so for me, that is, that is my single passion that drives this idea of equity. I don't think we can say that we have an equ equitable system if women are still dying in childbirth of preventable causes. Mm -hmm. While I was preparing for this panel, I read somewhere from, I think it was a British medical journal that says about 5.4 million deaths happen annually, maternal death, and all of them, every single one of them could be prevented. And I just think that globally, as a global health community, we must take the same learning we got from the pandemic and bring it to solving maternal health once and for all. Thank you, Tammy. I really appreciate both of you sharing your personal stories. And for me, it's a takeaway that part of how we move from rhetoric to reality is to make it personal and, and, and tell stories about your personal experience. And if you haven't lived through it, as you explained, you have to at least understand what it's really like and, and be able to put yourself in people's shoes. And I think that's where storytelling is so important. I'll quickly just share a reflection. I was, I was listening to your story and thinking, um, just to share a bit of my personal story, global health equity hit home and away from me. Uh, the last time I was on stage for a DevX event was February 20th, 2020, at our Prescription for Progress event in San Francisco, which was mentioned earlier, focused on global health, tech, and innovation. And I was very pregnant, but not yet a mother. So I would hear about maternal mortality and of course think it was a very critical issue, right? But I hadn't experienced childbirth and bringing a baby into the world. My son was born with a terrible case of jaundice. But thankfully I had all the treatment. We were able to bring lights home to our house and for 48 hours we had them wrapped in UV lights. And then I learned, it gives me goosebumps to talk about it, about how hundreds of thousands of children die of jaundice every year. And so, that to me, it was a moment that led me to want to take action. And so if we haven't experienced those inequities in our life or, or, or the ability to get the service that we need and, and realize that others don't get it, um, we at least need to hear these stories and tell them. So I really appreciate your personal stories. Now, Temi, you mentioned something I wanted to um, highlight. You talked about how, well, I can't solve this whole problem, but I can tackle one piece of the problem. So you're tackling a piece of the problem at LifeBank you're tackling pieces of the problem at, at action. And I wanna hear more about what you're doing at action. But there are systemic issues here. So individual entrepreneurs, individual activists are only gonna be able to do so much. I wanna also get to the systemic challenges and what more is needed. So first let's hear a little bit more about action. You told us about your personal path to where you are today. How did that lead to your work at action? And tell us more about what you're doing to move from rhetoric to reality on this issue. 
So there are two components, right? For personal as an activist and then as a director of the Secretariat at Action, which is Global Health Advocacy Partnership. So we have 15 partners in five continents and they have worked on health equity, health for all issues before the health equity word got sexy, right? So we have worked before then. And so they work on different ways. They are leaders in their own countries and regions. So they have individual value add that they bring working in their own influence of sphere, sphere. And then they bring the collective power of sharing at the global level. So three things that they work on, resource mobilization, more money for global health, health equity everywhere. And then uh, the second is the policies that are um, equitable. And then third is accountability. So these three components are the main overarching angle. And as a personal, as activist, I feel like what you mentioned, Catherine, about the systems, mm -hmm. right? So health equity is not an isolated issue that can be tackled vertically. It's part of the socioeconomic disparities. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have a role where we can tackle health equity vertically because we can't wait until the socioeconomic um, disparities are dismantled, right? But at the same time, we cannot lose the sight that there's a horizontal bar, mm -hmm. right? In US, there's a 2.9 times more the black maternal mortality is higher than the white maternal mortality, right? So those things, they exist within countries and between countries. And it's a paradigm, it's a colonization, the paradigm that needs to be dismantled. Mm -hmm. And so for me, 30 years in this field, I have worked on it. And I just want to add one personal story really quickly. So when I was living in India, doing as a physician, human rights activist who was recognized at the national level, I would be invited here for keynote speaking, for all these congressional briefings, you name it, and I've been there. I've traveled to more than 60 campuses doing workshops and talk, uh, talking in Europe and US. So I would go back very happy in India saying, oh, I contributed, I spoke truth to power. And my time was worth it because I wasn't earning out of it. I was a physician, so I would take away time from my practice, but I thought it was worth it. It took me, again, 20 years living here to see how that was exploited. So all voices are needed, but at the same time, it's important to understand that the lived experiences or the people from South are brought in but do they have a seat on the table? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are they involved? Are we sharing the decision-making with them? Are we sharing resources? Mm -hmm. Are we willing to concede some power, right? So that is where I think uh, my personal passion is. And if there's time in this conversation, I wanna hear of models where that's worked well, where, where there is actually that seat at the table. Um, but, but Temi, I want to bring you into this and better understand, you talked about your initial motivation for getting into this work with LifeBank. Um, what I have not had the chance to hear from you about is, uh, speaking of all the change in the past three years um, and, and what will be revisited uh, next year at the UN high-level meeting on UHC, um, actually there's been backsliding on so many of the issues that you've worked to tackle at LifeBank for factors beyond your control. Um, the impact of COVID on maternal mortality has been devastating. So can you talk us through life bank, you know, in this COVID time? What has that looked like? How have you worked to, you know, continue your mission and yet you're up against some pretty daunting challenges? Thank you. So there are three things that we really are passionate about and sort of like three buckets of thinking about how we build our work, um, our life bank. First is innovating, right? Innovating to solve entrenched problems. Um, the next one is really uh, not being afraid of profit, right? Having a comfort with um, emerging profit with um, um, impact, right? And feeling very comfortable in those two silos. Mm -hmm. um, often because, you know, historically, the folks who charge for services will be on one side and, and the people who deliver free services will be on the other side. For us at Live Bank, we feel a, a complete comfort in both sides. Uh, and then the third one is really looking for global partnership to accelerate our work uh, and to catalyze the changes that we're trying to create. So on the innovation side, I think something really magical happened at Live Bank during COVID that I think was really interesting. Um, we entered COVID operating in two cities in one country, 
one product, basically distributing blood and blood products. Um, we now, today, we operate in three countries. We, we you know, have a marketplace that connects thousands and thousands of hospitals at the last mile with four different types of products. We produce oxygen, and the business has really grown and expanded, and there's a confidence in how we innovate right? There's a confidence with the problem we're innovating for. And, and there's clarity on our side uh, in the business as we're here to solve problems. We're going to solve that problem first using technology, uh, distribution, and then we're going to figure out the business model after. On the profit side, again, I've always been, you know, we've, we've sort of like engaged with this idea of cross subsidization. And I want to talk about it briefly. The idea of charging people who can pay more, charging them more, and then making sure that that subsidizes for the last mile. Mm -hmm. And we're very comfortable with that business model because we think inherently there's justice there, right? Uh, so for me, I think that's another sort of like paradigm that COVID really brought. Because while we were all locked down, very, you know, people at ministerial level would call it to me and say, I need oxygen, right? But what I'm able to do is, well, I'm going to charge you a lot more, right? Because you have the resources. And I'm going to make sure that this very tiny hospital in the middle of the last mile, right, in, in, in a place where no one knows about, has access to oxygen. And that's how I'm going to play this. Uh, and we, we've sort of like taken that and run with it. The th third part is really figuring out the path to partnering internationally, uh, to working with institutions like School Foundation, like Merck for Mothers, to really have them catalyzing the progress that we're making, expanding us to, you know, powering our expansion to Ethiopia, to Kenya, to places as far as Meiduguri in Nigeria and Borno State. Um, so for, for me, I think those are the three things that have changed during COVID for Live Bank. This idea, again, of innovating, that confidence to innovate, um, you know, the, the um, being comfortable with profitability and cross-subsidization, and then really looking for international partnership to catalyze our work, particularly in places where it's not inherently uh, profitable yet really helpful. Um, I really, I have further questions for you, but I want to bring in a perspective from the audience. And um, I think we have someone here in the audience from Seed Global Health, which I think would have a unique perspective to offer. Um, let me make sure we can get you the mic and we'll have you introduce yourself and pose a question. Thank you so much. I'm Bonaventure Isiwe from Seed Global Health, I'm Managing Director for Impact and Strategy. Thank you so much for bringing up this uh, topic on sort of like transitioning from rhetoric to reality. And I think it comes at a very good timing as we head into the next uh, high level meeting. It feels like yesterday in 2019 when we had the last um, uh, high level meeting. And I think personally, I was feeling like everyone was truly hands on deck. There were tons of commitments, we're leaving no one behind. There was that one moment in time when I thought we're not just speaking about it, we're actually going to do it. And then, as if it was like a harbinge of what was going to come, COVID strikes. Just here in New York, it was a classic illustration of what iniquity could look like. And I think for me, what stood out for me in terms of like distinguishing rhetoric from reality is who actually holds the power to make a difference. I, I, I felt like there's... There was a trigger in nationalistic tendencies. Uh, there was firewalling uh, of access. Uh, and it's held not necessarily by us, not by activists, not by technocrats, uh, but it's in trade-related agreements. It's in insurance uh, policies. It's, it's firewalled in instruments that not necessarily those of us here have control over. So I think my question to the panel is, how do we bring those invisible actors to the table because it, it sounds like we're talking to each other, celebrating it, we truly believe in it, but someone holds the power behind us. So how do we bring those to the table? Thank you. Thank you, Bonaventure. Great questions. Uh, who holds the power? And actually it, it brings home something I, I had hoped to revisit. You mentioned we need to bring these voices to the table, but as Bonaventure put it, how? <laughs> so let's end with that. How do we bring these voices to the table? So the thing is, assuming that those powers want to concede their power, that's the toughest thing, right? So if we cook food and put on the table and bring the actors, bring the different stakeholders and give them pepper and salt, say make the food, how much can they change? Mm -hmm. So we need to have stakeholders on the table, who, when, why, 
so what is so crucial. You can have people who look like me or who look like you or somebody else. We can have them. Do they have a voice? We are often tokenized, mm. right? So the, it's 80% of the CEOs and the board chairs are white in US. They hold the power. So the one thing is that the whole post-George Floyd moment, there is a lot of talk about equity. So that's a great thing. Right, so people are forced to make that change. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that I think it's like a pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. So when the steam builds up, you have to let it go a little bit so that it doesn't blast. Mm -hmm. So the system gets really, the whole colonized paradigm, the holders of the power becomes really nervous when the steam builds up. So we need to build up the steam so that people who are sitting in this room, people like us who negotiate, who sit on the board, uh, boards and boardrooms, they are brought in to let that steam. And then we remember that steam was built outside of these rooms. Mm -hmm. So the, then we bring those voices in and share our power as well. So I think that is where we need to have diverse movements. Uh, and when we lay out the table for any conversation, we do ask, is it tokenized presence here? Or are you really uh, part of the conversation? Mm -hmm. Uh, shared resources, decision making, and freedom to speech needs to be on the table. Thank you. Tell me, what would you add to that? Um, so I think for me, I'm both an optimist and, and I'm going to be both optimistic and realistic. And I think for me, when we're thinking about power differential and global health um, and, and driving this equity in terms of leadership, um, I think really we need to focus on the money. Where is the research? Where are the resources? Where are they flowing from one place to the other? Um, you know, there is a comparable company that uh, very com comparable to what we do at Live Bank. And you know, if I look at the total amount I've raised, both from venture capital, from debt capital, from you know even you know non dilutive grant capital, it's by order hundred percent, hundred x larger that they have raised than I have raised. And in terms of progress, we're very you know we're not too far from each other. So if we look at again, if we're really very very uh, serious about solving and bringing equity into the decision that we're making as a global health community, I think we need to focus on where the resources are. But in terms of, and, and how the resource flows, but in terms of, um, I mean, I look at my story, right? And, and how I got to this room. And I think that it, it should make us feel optimistic that we are somehow listening to diverse voices. Like you said, it could be tokenized, often it is, uh, but at least when we have those opportunities, I take it as my responsibility to tell the story of other innovators that are just like me doing work very similar, maybe even better uh, than I'm doing uh, on the continent, you know, in, 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 in India, in Southeast Asia, across the global, uh, uh, global south. So for me, again, I feel optimistic because I'm here. Uh, and I think there are many more of me, so let's go get them, let's back them, let's give them the resources. And I'm very grateful uh, to the people who backed me, uh, who got us, who accelerated us and got us in this room. Uh, folks like, again, like I mentioned, school, folks like MSD for Mothers, and many, many others who've seen the work that we're doing and wanted to invest. Well, thank you so much, Temi and Vanita, for sharing your stories, for sharing what you're doing on this topic. And let's hope that a year from now, we have a lot more examples of reality, not just rhetoric. And I think a big part of that is partnerships. So hopefully uh, those of you in this room, well positioned to take action on this topic can talk with our panelists, talk with each other and uh, help in the shift from rhetoric to reality. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.